everyone. Welcome back to the Weekend Ball Podcast. I am Alex Adams, live here in Jakarta, Indonesia. And I'm not even going to like go to the intro. Canada has finally made the Olympics after 24 years. And I would not want to talk to anyone but Blake Murphy, who I think is just so committed to this program that he literally does his show, Blue Jays Talk, while watching Team Canada, which is amazing. I don't know what your sports net... Uh, uh, higher up say to that but thanks so much uh, Blake for coming on the show and uh, it's just I, I'm so happy I get to talk to you especially on the biggest ga- game and day in Canadian basketball history in, in 24 years man I uh, yeah I may have had a cough or something like that and not been able to come on with you if they if they lost that game and all we were left with was the last three minutes of the third quarter uh, this is incredible, man. I, I'm very happy to be on with you. I'm glad you got to do this live from Jakarta. I'm pumped for a lot of people man obviously there's a a lot of tournament left to go here and the world cup in my estimation is the biggest and best and most difficult uh tournament on the basketball calendar but this is huge i know the olympics is the most important thing for a lot of people i know the olympics is the most important thing for a lot of players and a lot of people with that national program uh this is it's huge it's uh like you said on the men's side at least the biggest moment since Canada beat Yugoslavia in the 2000 Olympics, except for maybe the Raptors championship. If you want to consider yeah. that a Canadian yeah. basketball thing, uh, it's an incredible, incredible day. And to do it in that style against Spain was amazing. No, it's funny. I was actually watching that Yugoslavia game today, maybe just to to give me the chills and, and to remind me of what it would be like just to see Canada at an Olympics, but just what, like, first thing, what, what, do you think this will mean for for the basketball in this country like you alluded to it maybe one of the biggest moments in the in the program's history in, in Canada basketball but just what will it mean now to to go to the Olympics finally yeah. with the men's program yeah I think there are a couple things it does and some of them are maybe more relevant to listeners and some of them are less so but I think you know the most important thing is uh from a general you know we can include players and coaches in the program and fans in this this kind of specter that has hung over everything for two decades now of whatever can go wrong will go wrong. And it doesn't matter how much elite talent you develop at the youth level and you're winning U19 goals. It doesn't matter how much elite talent you develop at the NBA level. You have 20 plus NBA players. It doesn't matter that you have guys through every rank of FIBA and you dominate, you know, the in-season qualifiers because of the depth of your program. There's been this cloud that that stuff doesn't matter because Canada hasn't been able to get it done on the biggest international stage. The 2019 World Cup was obviously a big disappointment. You can go back to 2015 with the near miss there. The 2016, you know, never really had a chance in the Philippines, but 2021 hosting a last chance qualifier. And I think for a lot of people, this will be the chance to exhale and get back to just being a fan of whatever team they put on the court and not worrying about these kind of uncontrollable feelings of doom that have come with the program for a long time. I think that's a big part. I think from the player perspective, uh, there's obviously a potential snowball to this where guys are going to guys who didn't commit to this three-year window and and whether Canada basketball continues to do the, you've got to commit multi years Mm -hmm. or whatever, um, you know, there's a wealth of players to pull from. And I had imagined the pool of players putting their hands up continues to expand now that they see what this team was able to do, what it meant to them, what it meant to the country. Uh, The fact that these guys who were in this tournament are probably going to have first dibs on those Olympic spots. If if health permits and contract permits and stuff like that, And then more from a like organizational standpoint, and this is not something anyone really cares about that much, but like from a, if you want to have the money to do a month long training camp and play three exhibition games in Germany and play three exhibition games in Spain and host an Olympic qualifier tournament and do all of those things that big money programs are supposed to do. Well, I don't know that the sponsorship money and stuff like that lines up cycle after cycle after cycle if they keep disappointing i really do wonder if had they not pulled this off and 2020 what do we know 2027 we're doing this all again uh, of get in now and and, you know help fund this team and you're first in line for the olympics i i do wonder if there's like a real business impact of it as well where this can kind of now 
you know, snowball positively where look, look at the reaction to this. Look at the, the reaction on social media and the ratings and stuff like that for games first thing in the morning for the chance to qualify for the Olympics and what the appetite is going to be like um, for an Olympic tournament where the times are more reasonable. And, you know, again, it's the Olympics. People in mm -hmm. North America care about it more. Like I, I'd imagine there's a, a snowball effect on the, the kind of corporate side as well, which can put Canada basketball in a position of strength to, you know, keep doing the things that a, a top program is supposed to do. No, that's interesting because I've been talking to Mike Bartlett like a little bit. No, I'm not saying a lot. And I had an interview with him at uh, on Raptors Republic that I wrote a little bit about. But he talked about if they are to make it that, you know, he's lined up a lot of things and and, and sponsorships. Like, I, I don't know the details, but um, it's he was definitely prepared for this. And he talked about it just really how important it would be for the whole program and basically the, the whole organization as a whole. And right. And and with that like he has to insure the players that's not cheap like how oh, how man. how especially how with nba contracts going hmm. where they're going like like i know J jamal's a health thing but like once he becomes extension eligible and things like that and um you know every we know every player when they hit free agency like this is another thing about avoiding the olympic qualifying tournament too is that's july 2nd to 7th that's during the free agent moratorium where anyone who is a potential free agent ain't showing up for that one that's yeah. they, you're talking millions and millions in insurance there yeah, no, no, exactly. And uh, I mean, I was just thinking about SGA, right? What did he, what's his contract? I know you always know it off the, but it was what, 150 million, give or take? Like, yeah, for it's, five it's years? a lot of cake. It's, it's a lot uh, of cake. I forget the exact number, but. But yeah, so that it's just, but let, let's get back because I think fans want to just talk about the game. And mm -hmm. I think I tweeted about 45 different times that they were done. And I, I just saw flashbacks of Venezuela, of Czech Republic. Um, what what were you thinking early in this game at half after that third quarter where they went up and then back? And so it's just, ah, oh, just, just tell me about what you're feeling right now as just a fan of this program and, and watching that game today. Yeah. I didn't feel great at halftime, but it's still a lot of time left, right? Like you get the breather to make adjustments. The first quarter, obviously whistle wise didn't go anywhere near the way you'd want. I thought there was some, pretty low hanging fruit defensively that Canada just wasn't executing, you know, the number of back cuts, uh, even the, the first half closed with, I think it was Nunez with the floater uh, baseline because the big didn't want to come over and potentially open up the dump pass. It's just like, okay, but you can't leave the floater wide open. And, and you know, the Hernan Gomez are so smart and so savvy and Santi Aldama like picks at your, your weak spots and stuff like that. Spain is a really well-equipped team to take advantage of it, of any opponent that, isn't on a string defensively and isn't picking up every little thing. So I thought coming out of halftime, there could be some pretty straightforward adjustments and you get the breather from foul trouble and things like that. Um, so I was okay. But at the end of the third quarter, I was a wreck. Like, yeah. I think I, I saw bit your through my, yeah, yeah, I think I bit through my teeth, like clenching my jaw and just, um, you know, there's obviously the feeling of, any game like that is so disappointing, but it really did feel like at the end of the third quarter that there was, you know, 20 plus years of weight on that. And I'm not saying back in, you know, 2004, I was living and dying with the America cup results when Canada yeah. comes fourth instead of third. Uh, I wasn't that <laughs> locked in on it, but I would say like from 2008 onward, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, that, that builds. And I think it builds for the program and the players and certainly the people covering it and cheering for it and stuff like that. And I really, really felt that at the end of the third quarter. And I wondered if that burst at the start of the third quarter was, you know, maybe that was the last counter punch they had and yeah. mentally, how do you respond? You erase a double digit lead and then you get back down double digits over a three minute stretch. Um, you know, I, I didn't know. And I didn't know. We haven't seen Jordy as a head coach in that spot. We haven't seen, you know, Shea and Dylan said after the game, this is the biggest game either of them played in, right? Um, you know, RJ did it at the the U19 gold level and, and kind of was the, the leader of that team, but um, he was obviously deep in foul trouble. So you just don't know. You don't know. Is Dylan going to step too far over the line with the Dylan stuff? And, and with the way he, he played, almost, he thank, almost got, thank goodness they oh made the God. right call on the Santi Aldama rebound yeah. and the, the knock in his head. Um yeah, that was not malicious. So with... That was not malicious. Yeah. Yeah. And malicious doesn't always matter, but like Santi Aldama had the arm barred as well. Yeah. So like Dylan couldn't use his other anyway. It, it's I'm very glad yeah. that, that didn't happen because I, he was I, so I, instrumental. 
but mm-hmm. you don't know, right? Like you don't know how Dylan's going to respond in that spot. You don't, you have an idea of how Shea's going to respond in that spot. And, and he's done it pretty consistently late in games, but you don't know for sure. You don't know how Jordy's going to respond. You know, Kelly being shelved to the bench because of, you know, not playing particularly well and the mm-hmm. early, early foul trouble. How, you know, if you need to call on him for a couple minutes, what does that look like? Um, you know, Dwight Powell had his best little burst of the entire tournament there. You just, you don't know how those things are going to line up, even if you want to assume the best of every person. And then there's the factor that like, even if you were at your best in the fourth quarter, it's still Spain. Yeah. It's still like Santi Altama and w- Willie Erna Gomez and Sergio Scariolo. So, yeah, I was pretty low at the end of the third. And and I don't think it was until Shea hit the go-ahead bucket that I was like, oh, I, I think I had tweeted before that. Like, it's right there, man. Just I know. But I don't think I, I really let myself believe that the comeback was all the way. Like, them tying it to me was not the comeback. Shea no. hitting the go-ahead bucket. I was like, okay, this is a game now. Let, let's go. No, that's funny because they they got up, I think, three in the third quarter, and then it went back to, to Spain up 12. And yeah. it just felt they could get close, and then Spain went on a run, right? And so I, I think when Shea got that end one, and then I think he hit a shot to to tie it. I'm not, I forget the, the sequence off the top of my head, but um, once once he made that shot, I said, oh, my God, oh, my God, they're going to win. Like, I really... I really thought because their defense was so locked in and mm-hmm. maybe tell, tell us me a bit about, about like what changed defensively too, because I thought that was as much as the, the change as their offense. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, especially the early part of the third quarter, it was just locking in a little bit more. Like I said, there was some low hanging fruit that they were just not executing well. Um, you know, you, you front a post up and no one, no one picks up if that guy slides you know, out of that, out of the post up and into a back cut or something like that. The number of times Canada got ready to switch in action and a guy came up to the level of the level of the screen and then the the screener slipped or something like that. Like Scariola's just got, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, fun little wrinkles like that and Canada wasn't particularly well prepared for them. I also thought they did a really poor job and I don't know if the numbers bared this out, but it felt like they were doing a poor job on the, on the, the defensive glass for a big chunk of the the first half. Yeah. And like, because that was an issue against Brazil as well. Um, and, you know, the Brazil game was a lot of like, they were getting killed on the, on their own glass. And part of that was because they were scrambling out like crazy on shooters, but Brazil wasn't shooting really well in this one. You also had like Spain hitting. Okay. On threes. Um, anyway, so that was, that was one of the bigger things. And then over the last few minutes and, you know, the fourth quarter and part of the reason they went to, you know, small, um, and it's not like crazy small for FIBA, but Dylan Brooks was effectively the power forward for a good stretch there um, was so that they could switch a lot more freely. And it wasn't necessarily a, a switch everything, but certainly like, you know, play that kind of more physical FIBA screen defense where the ball handlers, man, the screener and the screeners, man are all kind of in a three man jumble. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, p- peel off from there as you need. Um, I thought transition wise, they did a way better job um, picking up extra bodies. There was one play in the, I want to say early in the fourth where it looked like Shea was going to, it was off a turnover. It looked like Shea was going to have to pick up two on one and Dylan came back and he was gunning for the ball handler initially. And then him and Shea, I don't know if it was a nonverbal communication or Jordy from the bench or whatever, but at at like the exact right timing, Dylan peeled off to get the trailer to make Mm -hmm. sure there was that pass wasn't there. It, It was just a lot of little stuff cleaned up. And I think even though Spain's, bigger than Canada nominally when Canada goes small um, they don't have the ability to you know break you down one-on-one yeah. the way that some teams might take advantage of that they they could do some stuff obviously in the post on the offensive glass Aldama was amazing um, but you know you even look I think he had a zero in the assist column like he's got a He's got to be a play finisher for them, not a yeah. advantage creator initially. So, um, you know, and I think even a couple times when they went to w- let him work on the block, Dwight Powell did an okay job. So um, a lot of little things, like I don't think it was a huge schematic shift that I'll have to watch okay. the second half back yeah. a little bit, but you know, the low hanging fruit, the, a little bit more switching uh, again, Dwight Powell went from being a, a non-factor for parts of this tournament to being really, really important in the last He's few minutes. Really well, yeah. yeah. Just a lot of stuff pulling the right way. No, it's it's. I, I mean, I think there was a video uh, on the broadcast of them kind of being emotional in the locker room. I I, I didn't I didn't see it. Obviously, I'm here, but even at uh, um at uh, the um just at the media sc- or mix zone, sorry, 
uh, he was like almost crying. Like I said, like, what does this mean? Dwight to Powell you? was. Yeah. And he's yeah, like, he was, the he locker was room like, got a he's good like, shot. I, he's like, I can't, like, I just can't. And I was like, oh, and then I asked, they Kelly, got a good shot of him in the locker room on the sports that broadcast. And he was, yeah. I mean, a couple of the guys were, were very teared up, but Powell was probably the most emotional. And then like, I don't know. I like Kelly Olynyk is not an emotive guy, mm. but I'd imagine for Kelly Olynyk, this is, uh, he, even no. if he doesn't show it, he, he's probably top no, of the list. Emotionally. No, that's funny because I asked Powell and then he kind of like brushed, not, not in a bad way. Like he was getting, he's like, I, it was one of those where he, he didn't say it, but he's like, I don't want to cry in front of you um, <laughs> type of uh, kind of gestures. And then I asked Kelly, like, what does it mean? He's like, I'm just happy, man, or something. And just kind of walked back. Um, and then I don't know if people saw the RJ clip, but he was uh, definitely very happy. And that's something that he's uh, definitely excited to, to don't you know stick it up and to his I, I think that that's an interesting contrast in like Dwight Powell and Kelly Olynyk are a little older and have been through this like Kelly's been a part of the program for like 15 years now and like RJ Dillon and Shay obviously know what this program means and know what the last 20 25 years been like RJ made the comment uh to a rash on the broadcast like last time Canada was in the Olympics he had just been born yeah yeah like that's yeah. but <laughs> at the same time like these guys haven't gone through it as many times so like i found the contrast pretty interesting between like olenic powell and edgem who were like fine like a more of a finally energy yeah. and then like the young crew that's like yeah we made the olympics like let's go like, like yeah, yeah it's yeah. cool first time in a long time but like i don't know if they were being completely honest with you like rj and shay probably think they're gonna get a couple cracks at this if they want which yeah. is it's cool you it's a great swagger to have and part of why like having a young core coming up can you know help you shake off some of those like 2015 2016 demons with with Shay just the whole tournament and I, I mean I haven't been around him like on an NBA level but that guy is just cool as a cucumber <laughs> every like he doesn't he plays amazing it's like yep he plays terrible like against the Brazil game he, he actually he was the only person for Canada to talk to the media in like the mix zone and he was like, it, it almost looked like he was like, oh, I'm going out for a walk in the park. Like it, it was <laughs> it, it, not, not emotional or anything. So he's probably um, busy crafting what the Instagram caption is going oh to be. Oh my like God. The, the witty His... or rhyming Instagram caption. Yeah, I know. I, I'm excited to see the next one uh, that uh, he puts out with a ca Canadian basketball jersey or something, or maybe something with his mom obviously made the the olympics yeah. as well um but uh no that that's that's another podcast maybe um but uh just what happened to that for like talk about shay and, and dylan brooks like just like oh my god and dylan brooks had a couple threes where you're like no no yes i, I that's how i felt yeah that's dylan brooks's entire personality though right it's yeah. like dylan brooks is the ultimate no no yes guy usually defensively and like toughness wise um, yeah, I mean, Dylan's was, Dylan's side was pretty straightforward where, you know, playing through foul trouble is huge for a guy like that, like the ability to do that. And, and you know, he got the offensive foul in the first half that that first put him in foul trouble. And you wonder, does that change the aggression level? And it's so fascinating for me with guys like Dylan and, and you know, a Draymond Green type and any player who kind of fits that mold where so much of your value is that you are aggressive up to this line. And if you cross that line, you become a net negative player, right? Like this was a Tony yeah. Allen thing too. There are just guys like that. It's, it's a common hockey thing, you know, um, Michael Bunting for the Leafs or whatever. Yeah. Like you go up to that line, but you can't cross it. And it's such a Dream tough thing green. to toe. Yeah. And so, you know, with Dylan, obviously at times in his NBA career, he's blown past that line. Like, like hurdled over top of it and went to the other side. But in this one, I thought he found the right level of aggression. It didn't take him like he had a couple of big defensive rebounds down the stretch as well. Mm -hmm. He had the one kind of careless turnover and yeah, I, Kelly I missed it. the sh Kelly missed the shot too. And I don't know if I love the behind the back pass to Kelly for three. Um, I love the, the confidence in it, but you know, at mm -hmm. that spot in the game, but that's Dylan Brooks. Right. And, and you know, obviously you play that game out a hundred times. He's probably not going to hit three of three on threes all the time. He's not that level of a shooter, mm. but you need guys who are confident. You need guys whose games don't change when the game situation changes. And, you know, for Shay, I mean, look, we're going to see on Wednesday. I've been saying this whole time, like, obviously it's really, really nice to have the best player on the floor and there might 
not be a game in this tournament where Canada doesn't have the best player on the board. Now against the U S you might have the best player on the floor. And then like the U S has like number two through six. Yeah. But Shea, at least the level he's on right now and the level he played at this past season, you know, the only guy ahead of him on the MVP ballot in this tournament. And he was actually below him this year, but speaking historically, Luca's it. And obviously guys have played. Dennis Schroeder's been amazing. Willie Hernan Gomez has been awesome. Um, a handful of the U.S. guys have stepped up. But Wednesday's it of like, is Shea the best player in every single game in this tournament? And it's it's an oversimplification to say that about the fourth quarter. But you look at how the first half went and how much attention Spain was giving Shea. And he wasn't inefficient, but he clearly no. wasn't like comfortable creating his own. He had a couple... You know, there was the stretch where Shea posted up and got assists on Olenek buckets twice in a row. And yeah. then they took that away and Shea kind of made a an un like force it drive. Yeah. And it's tough. You know, a team as smart and big as Spain, when they take away your option A and then you, they take away your option B, you know, how do you respond to that? Can you still find ways? And this was just, I mean, 16 free throws in this game is just like that to me is such a, you just willed your team to where they needed to be. You put your head down, you got two feet in the paint, or, you know, I know a handful were in transition down the stretch or whatever, but 16 is 16. And then, yeah, you, you hit the pull up long too. It's like, okay, you, you went a little, you know, I was going to say Kobe, but for his age and being Canadian, probably more of a DeMar for him. Yeah. Um, But yeah, (laughs) it's uh, you know, that, that ability to get it done in a couple of different ways and go to an option C when a defense has taken away your option A and option B. I mean, we all think the world of Shea anyway, but to see him do it at this level against one of the best coach programs in the entire world where I guarantee you, like I know Sergio Scariolo a little bit, like they were coming in this game where if Dylan Brooks beat them, they were going to live with that, but they were not going to live with Shea Gilgis-Alexander just getting into short floater range the whole game. And Shea was able to adjust a handful of times and, and go about it different ways it was i mean he's already a superstar he came fifth in mvp voting but like if if he needed another superstar making performance this was it it was unbelievable it's one of like i I really do think you have to go back to the steve nash era for the last time we saw someone in a canada jersey play this well at on the men's side at least i have to ask you the controversial question that everyone is interested in is is shea gilders alexander right now for canada better than steve nash in 2000 um, uh, probably Tough. because Steve Nash wasn't like Steve. He wasn't full Steve Nash yet. Um, like it's a little bit of a tough one because Nash won his MVPs in what? Like 05, 06, I think. Um, yeah. so he wasn't yeah. quite that yet. Like he was still Maverick Steve Nash. Um, I think so. Probably like, I, I don't remember the 2000 Olympic games super, super well in terms of how they played out or whatever, other than Nash was amazing. Um, but yeah, probably. I mean, this is the same level of competition as Nash would have faced in those Olympics. And, you know, knocking off Spain in a must-win game for both teams is, degree of difficulty-wise, right up there with beating Yugoslavia in the Olympics. So, um, I don't know. I'll I'll say yes, but I want the ability to go back and rewatch yeah. some 2000 Olympics because I'm kind of just going off of uh, fuzzy memory on it. What's funny is that, uh, I mean, obviously, Corey Joseph isn't a part of the team, but he basically said, like, Shea's the best player ever to play for Canada at uh, the media availability in Toronto. And then immediately was like, oh, 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 no, uh, <laughs> I'm not trying to offend Steve. I love Steve and or something like that. So um, definitely- and even th- that tournament, like, obviously, again, he was really Steve Nash is Steve Nash. He was he's amazing. But like, I, I just brought the numbers up and like he he didn't lead the team in scoring he had a lot of assists but he you know six six point seven or six point eight assists per game and you know 12 15 points a game like those are really really good numbers and he shot really efficiently but like Shea just put up a 30 piece with seven dimes against the number one ranked team in the world like yeah it's hard even if i go back and i have like there is a steve nash thing right here oh really uh, on on my wall just a a casey bannerman original i yeah again tilt it there yeah oh my like, god that's, wow beautiful i love yeah. steve nash but i don't know that he's put up 30 pieces against you know the best team in the world maybe he did and i'm misremembering and i'm gonna look really <laughs> stupid for this but no, 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 um no. yeah man it's hard it's hard to imagine uh that level of of play being reached i don't know pretty much at all for canada or for any team really 
Yeah, and um, I just I actually just got a Oof. SGA a Casey Bannerman jersey uh, coming in, so I'm I'm excited nice. for that. For I have that I as a... well. <laughs> By the way, I just looked it up. Nash had 26, eight and eight against Yugoslavia, so I'm gonna have to go back and watch okay. that game yeah, yeah. because 26, That's... eight and eight against Yugoslavia. I don't know. I might have to That's take tough. it back. I might have to go That's... rewatch that. That's tough. Um, and yeah. see because that is, I mean, that was the number one ranked team in the world at that point too. So. Mm -hmm. Were they man, 20, the 26, US? eight and eight. Oh my God, man. I, I, I know this is like a different podcast, but if he played in this era right now, oh my God, just oh, with dude, the shooting S like Steve Nash in this, because like, if you look at Steve Nash's career and you like the most fascinating thing, if you fire up his basketball reference page or whatever, um, and you can get this uh, like a tiny degree with Jose Calderon, but <laughs> like a monster degree with Steve Nash, you look at all these percentages and then you see how few field goal attempts he took. Yeah. And it's like, dude, you were shooting 45%, 47% on threes and only taking four a game. And no one would have blinked if you ever took it yourself. And obviously that was Nash and Phoenix's style of play and stuff like that. But Nash in today's game would be have like free reign to take like 12 threes a game. I feel like he'd be a mix of like, I, I can't maybe like obviously Steph just with the shooting i mean i'm not saying he's the same shooter but just that level of of, of shooter and maybe a bit of trey youngy like i don't know he'd be a really i don't anyways the, the, but let's let's get back to to the team um so are they winning the gold cup uh gold cup oh my god i went to soccer uh the fiba world cup uh you know obviously I, i'm gonna i'm going to side with no just because the odds are long of, of knocking off three teams in a row here and we saw against brazil that like you can only have one bad half really um and that's it and i think look if they i think they'll beat slovenia lithuania's size inside would probably give them a lot of trouble they're gonna have to get creative defensively with how they mm -hmm. handle double teams and fronting the post and you know you got to play with a lot of speed uh if you're gonna make up for you know the jv size disadvantage it's actually a big part of why the u.s was awful against it today they just you know they treated it kind of like the way nba teams treat post-ups and and with the smaller fiba space you can get more creative than that um i thought serbia looked awesome today against the dominican republic but i'd hope jordy fernandez has a better uh game than the dominican had in that one where they just really couldn't you know in part because of personnel they just couldn't adjust their defensive scheme serbia just kind of ran stack pick and roll down their throat mm -hmm. um i would like canada's chances against either of those teams but we're talking like at that level of play at that point in the tournament, you're talking like 55, 45, maybe. Right. And if you want to say 60, 40 Slovenia, and then 50, 50, if they get to the U S or Germany in the finals, um, you know, we've seen this Germany team twice as, I really as like Canada them. and yeah, they're uh, really good. They're really, really they're good. Really, and, and I think that they could give the U S fits in the semis. Like, I don't think it's a lock that well, the you know, U S losing to Lithuania actually helped them because they get Italy. Um, yeah. who I think is the weakest of the final eight teams. But uh, yeah, I mean, look, they're, even if you go 60, 40, 55, 45, 50, 50 for your confidence level in them winning, you, you play those scenarios out. You can't, I'm going to take the field over Canada, yeah. but I feel good about their chances in each individual game. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I'm pretty, I don't know what you think about it against Slovenia, because you, you mentioned how Shea versus Luca obviously might be the, the who's the best player in this tournament, maybe even in a way the world. Um, but Jokic might have something to say with that. But uh, with that, like what 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 I'm I feel pretty confident against Slovenia just because the way they looked against Germany and just Luca kind of tailed off and and it's maybe not as strong a Slovenia team that almost won a medal in uh, Tokyo. Yeah, and they are they don't shoot very well. Like, obviously, Luka will hit a bunch of pull-ups, but outside of him and Propelic, um, they, they don't shoot the three very well at all, or at least haven't in this tournament. Mike Toby is really nice. Like, that's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's a, a guy who's a, a real piece for them and a real factor on the boards, but he's not the type of guy that, like, like I think you're comfortable with Dwight Powell and Kelly Olynyk in that spot. The biggest thing is going to be, you know, can, can Dylan... And then off the bench, Lou Dort, can they handle Luca? And they're not going to run. They're not going to spam Luca ISOs. Like they want Luca passing the ball and he's averaged like seven assists and probably would be up around nine or 10 if they could hit a three. But mm -hmm. yeah, Canada's going to task those guys 
with living in his Jersey and, you know, staying like they had to do today in the second half, staying on the right side of foul trouble. So, I mean, I don't want to oversimplify and says, say it just comes down to Dunchich, but it's, you know, unless Propelich uh, get, gets and stays hot from three, you know, almost all of their offense is going to run through Luca. So that's, that's where the game is for me. Luca looked, I got to look at and see what the news was today. He looked, I don't know if it was, maybe they were just getting blown out and they took their foot off the gas. He didn't look a hundred percent in mm. the, the second half of that Germany game to me. And I was kind of flipping between I, games. I, I, so. I heard that too, like on Twitter, but I, I mean, I didn't see it. Yeah. I was flipping between games at that point. Um, So I, I probably didn't get the, the best of look at it. I, I got to go back and, and watch a little bit more of it, but yeah, he looked like maybe he wasn't a hundred, a hundred percent. I don't know. It's yeah, uh, yeah. either way, Luca at like 80% and he's got two days off here to rest. He's going to be just fine. And yeah. he's going to be a big problem. Um, You know, I, I guess, with Slovenia too, the thing you're looking at is like, you know, they're not, they're not rolling a bunch of seven footers at you. Like Mike mm-hmm. Toby is seven feet tall, but he's not like a traditional rim protecting seven footer. They do have though, like size everywhere. Like in yeah. the same way that Spain did, I think they only play one guy. And I like, I think Propelich is the only guy in the rotation who's under six, five. Mm-hmm. And he's yeah. like a six, four pseudo point guard. So I think, uh, you know, that could be a, an interesting challenge for Canada too. And and with that, let's let's go to the Olympics because obviously, like, what do you expect from this team at an Olympics? Do you think guys like, like what I've heard is a little bit is that I bet Wiggins will ask to go. I bet Murray is probably a bit more up to it. Um, just would that be a good thing as well to maybe upset the Apple Card and, or just go best talent available and and yeah. just look. I think you have to be careful here because you did ask for the commitment and these guys did step up. I think Jamal, no question. If Jamal wants yeah. back in, you know, given the knee thing, given the championship run, like, I don't know, short of Denver winning another championship, which isn't off the table, given the no. way the, the NBA looks this year. Um, you know, I think Jamal gets back at Wiggins is the toughest one. Like obviously you expand the pool of guys if you're headed toward training camp and a couple guys are free agents or a couple guys are banged up or whatever. Um, and it's worth noting too, that, um, you know, the, the Olympic tournament is much earlier than the world cup. So mm-hmm. if you are talking about the way a guy's off season is structured, I think it's easier for an NBA player to commit to the Olympics. First mm. of all, it's only two weeks. It's not as far across the world. The ramp up won't be a month, I don't think. I think it'll just be a couple weeks of camp and a couple tune-up games. Uh, I don't think you're asking these guys for nearly as much as the World Cup requires of you, especially a World Cup in Indonesia. So I think you'll have more hands up. But I think, yeah, if you are if you are on this team right now, um, and with the exception probably of Scrub, who is on this team, I, I mean – I love him, but like he's on this team because Jamal and Cash has pulled out and yeah. you have to understand that um, he's getting a little older too. And, and then, you know, Trey Bell Haynes, probably same thing, right? Like you, you have to balance putting the best team possible on the court, but yeah, if like Wiggins and Chris Boucher and Andrew Nembard all show up, are you booting every single, like, are you booting a handful of guys off this team? I don't think so. Like, I think no. especially the eight or nine guys that have been in your rotation, barring injury yeah. they have the the inside track on on those spots and i think the other thing to keep in mind too is like obviously i we all want them to do super well at this world cup they're in the quarterfinals things like that the olympics there's less room for error because it's a smaller and shorter tournament it's not as good a tournament yeah so like you're, if you're looking need. at the chances uh for guys to do well and you're trying to sell them on hey come out and like really do something special tournaments only 15 days long and you're playing i think max nine games and you know you're you're gonna play a couple of teams that aren't i mean yeah that's probably an overstatement like france will probably bounce back a little bit japan's not that great even though they're a fun story south sudan we'll see because a lot of their how they built it you know we we got to look at canadians who yeah, and like stuff through the naturalization process and stuff. And I realize it's complicated because South Sudan is such a, a, new a young country overall. Like they've only been a FIBA member for a decade. So, um, you know, but I, I think like even Australia gets an auto berth because they finish better than New Zealand. We all know Australia is a very good basketball country, but like, are you coming into the, the way the Olympics better? look right now? 
are, are you worried about France and Australia? No, you're coming in thinking you're better than those teams and those are teams you should beat, even if they're difficult games. So um, I don't know. I'd be, I'd be pretty optimistic about guys showing up because after this World Cup, given the format and things like that, I think you can sell those guys on let's do something special here. Yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, it's I just to see them at an Olympics, man. I've I've just been waiting for this my whole life. And I keep thinking about 2015 and and I, I still remember where I was in 2021 and the Wigan shot and there was that exhale and you're thinking, oh my God, oh my God, they're gonna do this. And and now they're at an Olympics. And what do you think, Blake, this will kind of mean for basketball in this country? Like you you we touched on that a little bit, but is this almost like a moment similar to um the Raptors winning and obviously the women's team has been amazing so I don't want to take anything away from them but it's just the the fact of the matter is for the most part that the men's gets a bit more uh, attention so um yeah and I mean the men's also bleeds into NBA and the conversation around Canadian basketball at that level and stuff like that like I think we can hold both things at the same time by the way the women finished fourth at the last world cup so if you're looking Mm -hmm. for a goal gentlemen uh try to top that at least match it they got to the semis so need to see it here. Um, so I don't know. I, I think I, I really do think there's a, you know, a part of this where the men's and women's side can kind of feed into each other. And like, you know, there's a, a one hand feeds the other kind of or one hand washes the other kind mm-hmm. of situation where, you know, both programs succeeding is really good. And if there's a little bit of competition and, you know, obviously the sponsorship money and things like that goes always with, with Canada basketball. Um, so I appreciate you acknowledging that now in terms of, um, the impact this is going to have first, I think Tomas Sadoransky is allowed back in Canada. Now I think you, uh, you forgive him. Um, the Venezuela coach is not ba- allowed back in Canada still though. Uh, I, I'm, still- I, I, I didn't watch the end of the Dominican game, but he's now the coach of the Dominican. And yes. I, I want to see that, that I can still see that like Joker, like smile from a mile, yes. like in my ingrained in my, yeah. My Nesta head. Garcia running up and down the sidelines, uh, uh sticking it to us. Um, uh, Anyway, so in terms of the impact on basketball here, like, look, I think we're far enough established as a basketball country that this isn't, you know, this isn't going to be the Carter effect too necessarily. I, but I think, you know, you put it, we're only five years removed, not even from the Raptors winning the championship. Um, You know, these guys are all going to, I don't know, let's say they win the world cup or they, they medal at this world cup and they medal at the Olympics. Like, every time someone's talking about Shea Gilgis Alexander or Dylan Brooks or or whoever it's, you know, Olympic medalist Shea Gilgis. And Mm -hmm. and I think that, that, you know, the Olympics have a special place for people. And some of that is just the oddness of the Olympics and sports. You don't get to see a lot of times and stuff like that, but like ask a hockey fan, what their best hockey memory is NHL or otherwise. And I think in Canada, a lot of people are going to say the 2010 goal to goal game between Canada and the U S and it's because these moments, whether it's because of international play or everyone takes a time out to focus in on it um, or just the way we've been conditioned around the Olympics for our whole lives. These are really, really special things. Um, you know, the Canadian women on, on the, the world cup side of the Olympics or the Olympic side rather um, that was like the most special Olympic moment we've had in, in forever yeah. here. Uh, so I, I think the Olympics as as troubling as they could be politically and financially. And yes. even though I believe the basketball world cup is a bigger and tougher and better tournament, uh, it's really, really special. So I don't know that, you know, some kid is going to have seen the Raptors win the NBA championship, be unmoved by it and then see Canada in the Olympics yeah. and be moved by that. I don't know. Maybe that kid is out there, but I think all of this stuff pulls in the same direction and it, and it's been pulling in this direction since Steve Nash but yeah, Canada with every one of these successes becomes more and more of a basketball country. And I think that's, that's huge for just the identity of basketball here and of basketball fans. Do you think I talked to Mike Bartlett and he talked about how the goal is that making the Olympics is the norm and not almost like we don't even celebrate it. Do you think that's where we're headed for, for men's, the men's basketball program now? Eventually. uh, Yeah, eventually. So, and here's the other thing is like through, having success at the world cup 
and if you have success at the Olympics, well, those two things are the most heavily weighted things in terms of FIBA ranking. And then your FIBA ranking is what determines your seeding in things like an Olympic qualifier tournament or the World Cup. So all this time we've dealt with like 2019 Canada being in a pool with Lithuania and Australia. This tournament where, yeah, part of it was Indonesia wanting Canada there. Um, but part of it was also, hey, you're under seeded and you're a three seed in a tournament where you should probably be or you're yeah. a, a two seed in a tournament where you should probably be a one seed. You know, those things start to erase as well, where the FIBA system actually sets it up so that should be the case that once you yeah. start having success at that level it's a little easier to maintain because your seed's going to be better your pools will be a little weaker things like that and then i think the biggest part is you know the money is going to follow and the player commitment is going to follow because they're going to see how special this is and how much it's meant to those guys and, and to the country i think we're a long long way away from you know the way the u.s treats it where like it's not a big deal i think it's going to be a big deal at least for you know one more olympic cycle um yeah. and then yeah if you've made like five in a row then you you deal with it the other part too is like there are some America's programs that are really, really strong. So, um, you know, that Brazil probably team... the like other like uh, us, like America's in Europe is like by far the closest, like the toughest teams. Yeah. Like Europe has six teams in the quarterfinals of this World Cup and only two are going to punch their ticket to the Olympics. The other four are all going to the Olympic qualifying tournaments. Yep. That's. Uh, and then, that's... <laughs> Go for yeah. It. The America's like. Yeah. Dominican flamed out here. They weren't as good as maybe we we anticipated. Great for Canada. Brazil, I think, impressed a lot of people. Argentina's completely fallen off. Like, I, they didn't even qualify for the Olympic qualifying tournaments. Yeah, Bahamas, um, which is an interesting yeah. wrinkle. And they're kind of doing the the thing of naturalizing a, a handful of players there as well. So um, these things are always pretty in flux, and I, I think there's still going to be good competition in the Americas and things like that. But, yeah, these things should snowball. And, and I think, you know, I really do think the hurdle of, well, there's not this cloud hanging over that Canada will eventually blow it is a big thing at, at all levels. Player commitment, sponsorship, fan engagement, all that stuff. Um, I think it's huge, man. It this is a, a pretty a pretty special day. And the coolest thing about it is like it's a special day and a huge accomplishment that also serves to open up opportunities for even more special days and accomplishments. Yeah. Like, like this is the biggest thing they the men's side has done in over 20 years. And they also like Shea said it after the game. Yeah, we, we accomplished half the goal because the other half was to win the World Cup. And you yeah. still have that on the table. And now the Olympics is on the table. It's just like, man, it's just more and more stuff to get excited for. I just it's like it's funny because it's only a rash and I here. And I hope that changes where it's more media covering these tournaments. And I mean, maybe it's not halfway across the world, but um, I just hope it means not only that, uh, you know, fans and, and that the program successful but it just gets more coverage like people i was talking to shulman i think a day or two ago and he said like yeah people don't even know about it right like people know about every raptors game and people have no clue about this team and hopefully that changes because um it's so exciting like that end of the game like how that's better than I most mean, that's players. the thing you you take you take all our 20 years or whatever out of that even still and that obviously made it more special that is just one of the best basketball games you can watch yeah, yeah. like it's it just just unbelievable um yeah okay blake well I, i've kept you long enough uh what's what's your final parting thought or or anything maybe you can also plug your uh, jay's talk plus as well yeah as where i'll be where i will be clearly watching canada slovenia during my show on do you wednesday. know do we know what time those games 8 heard... 30 a.m eastern oh is my Canada's god this game on wednesday is that does that mean that you're working it's like at the like you start my the show's show. at 10 yeah so, so i will be if that game is close the first block of that show will be me just live commentating Canada, Slovenia. I think hopefully the Jays have a nice, like 10, nothing easy win on Tuesday. Oh yeah. Because that's uh, going to happen. They won't do. That's going to happen. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Who's, who's the man. I was going to say there, I felt there was a lot of parallels between the blue Jays and, and Canada basketball after that Brazil loss. That's what I was talking with Shulman, but <laughs> now it just feels as though the blue Jays on the, are on their own Island. So I'm I'm sorry you have to go through that, but at least you have this little nugget to to you know get excited about. Other than, you know, uh, runners in scoring yeah. position at 179, like batting average all year, or whatever. How poor, however poor they've yeah. been all year. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Well, this is the nice thing about being a multi-sport person is I could just tune the Jays out, and I mean, once I once we're done this podcast, I got to watch the Jays game. But um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can, you can. 
pivot and car- compartmentalize certain disappointments for uh now if canada had not done this today i think it would have been some some a really tough week for me on the air yeah i think it would have been a long 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 flight back uh to canada which is uh when do you fly out i fly out tomorrow night i just okay. just the fiba being fib FIBA, I just found out just as we were going on the shoot that I got my accreditation for Manila. So that's <laughs> great. So, you but know, you're not going. I I now have to think about it, but I don't think it's a it's expensive to f- cancel flights this last minute a day. I, above. I'd imagine it's expensive to fly to Manila for a, an extra week or or what do we? Yeah, we're a week out from the finals still. So yeah, so I, I don't think so. I wish I could if FIBA was kinder and would have gave me a bit more of heads up then maybe i would have done otherwise but um blake thanks so much for doing this um uh i hope we can you know or i'll we'll at least see you um on twitter and everything uh celebrating as canada goes deeper in this tournament uh hopefully you see me on television celebrating as they go further on wednesday yeah that just seeing that and then i saw people complain but it's also like a half complaint. i don't know if anyone really complained or just they were like hey you know we could see you right <laughs> yeah it's just like uh yeah. anyways okay well thanks so much blake um i love your stuff with the blue jays talk i don't know how you do 45 different things at such a high level so um you are you are the best and mm-hmm. uh i really appreciate you doing this especially i'm glad we got to celebrate after um, in my notes, it said jubilation or despair. We got to get the <laughs> jubilation. So I'm glad I could, uh, uh, I don't know how to describe jubilation, but I, I'm glad we got to celebrate together. So thanks again. Me Blake. too, man. And, and seriously, I, I'm so glad you got to do this. And I know there's not a lot of media there and that kind of sucks, but also at the same time, I think, you know, you'll probably look back on this last week as a, as a pretty special thing career-wise. I'm glad you've been able to, to be there, not only for the content and, you know, saying hi to Bruno for me and things like that, but uh, for you career-wise and life-wise, this is uh, this is pretty special. Glad you got to be there for it, man. Well, the the, the best part is that now Bruno and I ha- are talk talk to each other on a first name basis. So that I go. think that I think that was what I was trying to get from this tournament was just a bit more Bruno Caboclo love, you know, and, yeah. and in my career, I felt I was always a couple years away from being, a couple of years Ooh. away so yeah so uh but Ooh. bruno was amazing honestly the nicest guy so at least to, to me so um and that's what it sounds like so it was really cool to have a bit of a relationship but unfortunately uh he will not be going to the olympics or at least not Darn. not not anytime soon so maybe maybe Hate you to see it yeah but uh thanks again blake you are the absolute best everyone should check out your stuff at uh sportsnet i don't know how you do blue jays canada basketball i know you've done hockey too like everything so um i really appreciate it and uh now we need to get you onto like cricket or something or rugby we need to keep yeah adding to vivek has tried with cricket. i know i've written i've written about rugby before oh uh, when gosh. toronto wolfpack was first the thing I, I went down and did a couple feature stories on that i've done you know the pro wrestling stuff oh that's uh, true that you are a big pro wrestler who's, yeah who's the dylan brooks equivalent in like wwe oh i mean the the thing is is that like every bad guy is trying to be dylan brooks is uh, the thing there's not there's not really an equivalent because that's the whole if you're a bad guy that's that's what you're supposed to be like dylan brooks is being them um and they wish they had the heat that dylan brooks had yeah exactly exactly um thanks again blake i i really appreciate this and uh let's 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 try to get a gold let's let's do that that that'd be nice i think that's a, yeah like a shay one. said halfway accomplished goals yeah it's yeah. uh you know win the whole thing now it'd be, it'd oh my be god. pretty pretty crazy man pretty special. oh my god oh my god i think i'm just gonna end on oh my god they're freaking i i, I don't I, I think i can swear but i'm not gonna swear but they're effing going to the olympics and that is one hell of a way to to end off um jakarta and uh, i'll be uh continuing to to podcast throughout the rest of the tournament because they have three more games left so um at the very least so uh stay tuned and uh check out blake at uh jay's talk plus um on sportsnet every day every weekday 10 to 12 is that it yep i got it right okay perfect great i got the plug right thanks again blake i really appreciate it see you man